Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. This is January 1st, 2024, and I'm introducing a little project that I'm doing for this month of January. One of the things that emerged from my conversations with people last year was the, the vast number of people that I met for the first time, and, and our first conversation was the podcast episode well over 50 of those. And I've set up a, um, a playlist on my YouTube site uh, that captures all of these uh, first, first conversations, call first con conversations. So what I'm going to do for the month of January, every Monday and Thursday, I'm going to feature one of these first conversations. And I'm going to feature those that I feel like uh, there's something about them that is worth uh, paying some attention to. And, and in some cases, it's maybe that you all never got to hear this one because it was early on in the, in the year and you didn't know who I was yet. Whatever it may be, uh, I'm going to uh, present some of these back and uh, we'll, we'll see how this, um, how that, how this goes. Uh, the first one today will be Neil Sequeira, who is a uh, businessman in uh, Australia, and uh, he reached out to me and, and said he wanted to, to be on the podcast, and he and he wanted to talk about conversations, and he is the first one who brought the topic up during the course of last year. He was early on in the year, but he's the he's the guy that's, that uh, started the started that trend of having conversation about conversations. And I'm grateful for to, to Neil for that. And it was it was really great. And we've had some in interesting conversations since then. So welcome to the Eddy Network here in the 2024 20, year. And let's have a good time uh, having conversations. And here we are beginning with some from last year that I think you'll find very edifying. Thank you for watching and um, stay tuned for more. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and this is the Eddie Network Podcast. And my, my guest today is Neil Sequeira. I got it. Yep. It's good, to, good to have you here, Neil. Neil's from Australia, but uh, he's going to tell you about who he is and and we're going to have an interesting conversation today um, because we're going to talk about things we both like to talk about. And that's that's the best kind of conversation to have. So thank you for coming on, Neil. Uh, tell us where you live and what do you do and how how did we uh, come to meet each other? Thank you, Ed. Thanks for having me on. And uh, hello, everybody else who's darling and delicious. And it's been fascinating how we come to get in touch. Um, I think it's a little bit to do with, with both myself as a reader and myself as somebody who reaches out to people to connect when I find something that I like to read or that I've enjoyed reading. Uh, but a bit about myself, I suppose I moved to Australia uh, from I've been working around the place and moved to Australia about 13, now it's 14 years this year. And um, I work in a telco, uh, a telco here in Australia as, as a with a job title that means very little to anybody who asks me. And uh, when they do ask me, what does that mean? I say, well, whatever it is that I want to do. Uh, it's been a fun job for the last few years. So it's been, it's been one of those things where I get involved in everything that I'm interested in, um, which unlike traditional jobs, you did not cut to do just one thing. I can cut across and join several things. And I think uh, this is also a good time to remind myself about the book that you recommended me, Ed, uh, The Near Generalist that yeah. Ken Mickelson and uh, um, Martin? Richard Martin. Richard Martin. Um, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. But yeah, you had posted on a blog on Substack a comment. That's the one. And uh, read this book. You had read posted. This book. It's if you don't know how to describe yourself, that is one of the finest books I've come across. I've actually recommended it to about six or seven other people uh, recently. And one of the things, I, oh, how did we get to meet? I remember you had made a comment on a blog post that I was reading about something, and I had no idea what that was. I still haven't gone back to that. But I remember reading the comment you made. It was one line, 
And I was captivated, I think, because it was one, it was that moment of clarity amongst the, mm. the mess of despair or the mess of whatever mm. else it is that you call it. And, and I dropped you an email on LinkedIn. And I said, um, Ed, loved your writing. And good to connect. And then we jumped onto emails and we've been having conversations on email ever since. And then I don't think we did catch up once. Um, our time zones don't necessarily line up. So it's, it's, it's a 14, 16 hour difference, I suppose. It's um, six. Um, uh, it is 15 hours, 15 hour 15 difference. Hour difference. Yeah. And, and I'm groggy, but I am absolutely loving having this conversation at this time. Well, I'm groggy too. So, and I've been up, <laughs> I've been up a while. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you're here, and um, it is interesting that we can we can make this connection simply by reading a comment on a blog or a comment in a LinkedIn post or something like that, you know. And and I tell and I tell people that, you know, at the end of this thing, I usually say, well, subscribe to the to the podcast and click the like bucket button. But even more so, leave a comment because those comments really are parts of a conversation. So that's that's one of the things we want to talk about is conversation. And um, so I I don't have a I don't have really an agenda. I just would like us to, to talk about that. So let's let me ask it this way: um, the conversations that are are really valuable to you. Uh, what what goes into that? What do you find in those things which distinguish it that you're and so that you're actually looking for those kinds of indicators in a conversation uh now that you i mean once you've had some of those you, you realize oh so this is really the way i want to have conversations with people so so what does that look like i think this is a good model for a conversation we had no agenda we didn't necessarily decide to talk about this that and the other we gen broadly would like to talk about how we have conversations that to me exploration is a really really valuable form of conversation um if my aunt or my uncles um listen to this they're probably going to laugh at me because i used to complain that i was never a conversationalist and i didn't want to hate it and they'd say no you're not you could talk to a wall um and that's been true and i think it boils back down to i've always been a curious kid and I still like to think I'm 16 somewhere in some part of my body, but physical body doesn't <laughs> explain that. Uh, and the curiosity for me is about I'd love to know what people's stories are. And to me, that is a very useful form of a, a starter uh, of a conversation with anyone. How did you get to where you are? Why is it that you write what you do? How is it that you do what you do? Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about this strange kind of a screwdriver that you used to drive a a robotic arm into something technically it, it doesn't matter what the subject is i think people's stories are always fascinating and each mm -hmm. one of us is rather unique story so i'm finding that curiosity has gone a long way just just being interested has gone a really long way the other one that i find is technology has made it so much simpler and my idea for conversation was that it always had to be one-on-one -on -one. if face to face talking to um, mm -hmm. people in the flesh and um, imagine my joy when I discovered that internet meant you could send an email and you could wait for an email. It wasn't the same anticipation as a pen pal handwritten right. postal email. But the I remember being on, what are they called, IRCs uh, way back. And I didn't know how computers work, but I didn't know how to jump onto one and uh, talking to people and then sending emails and waiting eagerly for a response and patience was the other i think lesson that i've, I've picked up and i haven't actually thought, thought about this one too much until you asked me this patience because you have to listen or wait for someone to process your question and respond in the way they think about the question not necessarily the answer you're seeking mm -hmm. so exploration patience and potentially a third um, thread has more importantly been they are not transactions. Conversations oh. are more relationships. 
that's that's um that's a great that's a great thought i have never thought about conversations not being transactional uh but you're right i mean that's that's really true huh that's the, now you've given me something to ponder and i can i can run with that so and i'm not sure that conversations have to be transformational either i think no, they, they don't they can just be <laughs> Yeah, we're just hanging out. We're just hanging. A couple of guys, you know, across the world, hanging out, talking about things we're interested in. Um, do, do you um, do you go searching? How do, let me back up and ask this question. Um, I'm assuming that you like to have conversations with people that you're just meeting, that you don't know them, and therefore that the introductory there's an introductory conversation that takes place is that you like those is that something that you you uh, enjoy i i'd like to say yes and some of them then become more meaningful relationships right. which then become friendships uh, which then lead to other mm -hmm. more meaningful content um relationship I, I suppose i'll stop there and then it, goes, it keeps going deeper uh, I, I think of sometimes this is this is a transactional way of looking at it but volume like you don't know who you're going to meet um and who's going to be in within your circle of influence as, as, as your circle of impact i suppose as your book calls it out um but to me it's a case of it's a funnel you have to have lots of conversations to find the ones that are meaningful to you and then you spend some time it's always a function of time um you do not expect that to happen overnight and it sometimes it takes weeks sometimes it takes months sometimes years and sometimes all your life um and i i, th I would i would dare say that the most valuable for me has been not just the introductory conversations mm -hmm. the introductory conversations are a bit like a novelty i'm meeting somebody for the first time oh my God, the author of so-and-so book um, or a publisher of a blog or someone rich and famous is on YouTube. That used to be the drive for me way back. I don't think I care about it at all. Like I do not particularly fancy having going being connected with a lot of people. I like the idea that that can lead to something more. And as I've grown older, as everybody does, I suppose, um, I've come to the realization that it doesn't matter who you are, you're still human. The need to be seen, to be heard, and to be acknowledged uh, and valued is a universal need. You know, I, my intention um, is, to, is to meet someone to take that relationship somewhere beyond just the introduction. And uh, there's three blocks down the street here is a distillery, and I go there on Friday nights. You know, they're only a they're only open on Friday and Saturday nights. But I go on Friday nights and everyone that comes in, I talk to them. I go over and introduce myself and I find out who they are. One night there was a couple that came in and um, they, I introduced myself and they introduced themselves to me and they, uh, they have a local farm, but they had both been working in corporate work. Um, and then they, they, get, they left that and purchased this farm and uh, seemed to be doing really well with it. And, and then they said, well, you know, so who are you? I said, well, I'm just a leadership guy. And I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book that came out a few years ago called Circle of Impact. And the woman goes, Circle of Impact. I've heard of that. Where did I hear of that? And, and she's, she's looking off in space. And I'm thinking, what, what's going, you know? And all of a sudden, Oh yeah, my former boss gave me a copy of your book. <laughs> oh, there you go. And I'm thinking, I had, you know, it was one of the very first times I'd ever met someone who already had the book, and um, and I guess I said, well, I, I it doesn't sound like the book had had a big impact upon you. <laughs> she says, well, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> said, okay, well now you got a chance to go read it because uh, I think it it can have an impact on you. But you see that. You see, now that the humor in that and the surprise of that really 
then made the rest of our conversation that night even better. Um, yeah, and then uh, I'll give you one more example of this. So I had a guy just like you. Um, he reached out to me on um, LinkedIn a year ago, just a month, a year ago in, in uh, March. And he had he and his wife had read um, Kenneth Michelson and Richard Martin's book, The The New Generalist, like you have. And uh, and he and they they reached out to me through LinkedIn because they saw that one of Kenneth's stories is about me, and and so um, this fellow's um, he he says, well, I I live in Dallas, and I you know he, he described his work a little bit. I said that's great, and I and I said um, I have to I have to go to Wyoming and Utah in late April, early May. And I may come back through Dallas to see my my agent. He says, well, if you come, I'd like to get together with you. Okay. So that's not an unusual thing. People want to have conversations. People want to get together, particularly. And, um, and so, okay. Well, about every other week for the next month, he, he's, he contacts me and says, are you coming? Are you going to come to Dallas? And I'm thinking, I guess I'm going to go to Dallas. And so I, I arrived there and we're, we're scheduled to meet at 930 on a Monday at a coffee shop. And I'm sitting there and he walks through the door and he's carrying my book and a couple of my short books and they got bookmarks on them. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't have to tell him anything. He already knows. And um, see, that's in, and that idea right there is that most of the time we enter into new relationships where the other person doesn't know who we are. And so we're having to explain who we are. I mean, it's like you explaining to us uh, and the audience of, of this podcast who you are. And now they're getting to know you, um, not because of all the work that you do, but just because of who you are and your encounter with me. So we end up spending uh, a whole a whole day together all the way into uh, almost to midnight. I spent time with his wife and his two children, his two daughters, and then... Uh, Three months later, I came back and spent four and a half days with them, planning to spend a day. Wow. I ended up spending four and a half days with them. We we were doing strategy work on some of the projects that he's doing. So you know, it leads it can lead to a relationship where we both gain something of real worth. We get you know, if you're a consultant or a coach or someone like me, you get to you get to exercise your skills. If you're the other person, you get to learn something. And maybe contribute back. Oh, well, this is what you did, and that, and this is really helpful. Oh, that's good. I'll remember that for the next time I, I encounter that. Uh -huh. And 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 you bring up an, a rather interesting point for me, which is the value of serendipity. I think I I, I think about this all the time now. Is to find something that's in common, because what's in common is a good way to connect with new people mm -hmm. um, it could be the uh, I make a trivial example but it could be the school that you went to you hail from the same place and as an immigrant for me i find this quite fascinating because india is a huge country and i moved from india and sydney in, in um, australia where i live now is is one of the most multicultural countries that have mm -hmm. ever visited and i haven't visited that many so take this with a bag of salt but what I find fascinating is that even when I'm speaking to folks who hail from India or second generation or third generation uh, migrants to Australia, that theme still is powerful. Where do you come from? And it is not a rude question. It is a what do we have in common? You could actually replace the words where do you come from as what do we have in common? Is yeah. it our food? Is it our language? Is it, is it the schools that we went to? Is it you know, one of a billion and a half oh, you're from things. there. Do you know so and so? So and so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We went to high school together. Oh, yeah. Well, he's a great guy. Oh, know? it's your brother. It's your brother was my classmate, and and it's been fascinating because there's so many people that I've met now because of those things that are in common that we've been able to have a much deeper connection almost immediately. Not that that matters, but I think it actually helps if you have something in common. Well, it happened with us. Yes. Very dead. And, and, and so the, so the, the thing I take away from that, and this is not just between you and me, this is with almost everyone that I meet, 
the things that we we ha we share in common are much greater than the things that are different. And this is true globally. And yet we we live in a world where conflict and division uh, reign supreme, and th there's a whole reason for that. But for the most part, when you can encounter someone, have a conversation, then you can build a relationship, and that relationship can be built based upon some common shared experience or values, just, whatever it may be. I want to share a story. Um, Ed, you just reminded me of something, a conversation I've had last week um, with a senior leader um, where I work. And um, and this is this tells you about you know even people who are aware of this one can have some pre what do they call them predetermined ideas of biases of how you perceive someone um, and I've always considered this person to be you know aloof and and someone who's not in the same level as uh, you know everyday folks who work at the at the place. We got into conversation about their life. Uh, and I'm being deliberately vague here, but about their life in over the course of the last 10 or 20 years. And in that conversation, I realized that almost all of my predisposed ideas about about their life and what they were and how they were, were shattered. It took less than 10 minutes. Wow. Um, and it was one, one um, short conversation that changed, has been one of the most insightful for me ways of thinking about the stories we tell ourselves about other people and then we come into contact and they're glaringly different to the narrative that we've built up and then you're forced to do one of two things you're going to have to believe in your own story and saying no no, no what i heard there that was a mistake that's not true or reconcile it as i can't remember who said this but at a very fractal level and you realize that the, the, the stories can be true, not at the same time, because we both may have to make some adjustment. But in this case, it was me who had to make the adjustment, my worldview of the person. Um, and I've been reminded of that so many times. And last week was another gentle reminder. It, it wasn't a you know earth shattering moment. It was not transformational, um, but and it was not transactional because we've had much more deeper conversations since. That's great. That's really great. So. Um, so let me ask you this question, because I think, I think what you're, what we're exploring, discovering, is that we're learning how to have a relationship through this screen, like we would if we were sitting in the same place, in the same room. And learning how to do that, I think, is one of the skills that will set, will di differentiate people from people who are not very relationship oriented in the future. And, and the people who are capable of developing relationships that can function well in this context, 15 hours apart, as if there's no separation of time and space. Can I go off a, a riff off on, on something you said, which my head's been going off ever, yeah, ever since yeah. you said, sure. which is sure. the, the uh, which is the idea of journeys and, and discoveries. And again, I can't remember where it was from. I'll dig it out and send you that link to it. Uh, but somebody said, we're not actually on journeys as much as we are on quests. I'm, I, I remember who it is. The knighted Sir Ken Robinson. I, I was listening oh, yeah. to a, a talk he did and he said, um, on a journey means like you know the destination. You're actually on the, on your way to get there. But no, we are on a quest. We don't know what's on the other side. Uh, we might be knighted for it. And he made that joke about himself, of course. But um, he, he said we're on a quest because we don't know what we're going to find. We may lose our life doing this one. Not, of course, in a conversation. But um, the idea was very, very strongly appealing to me. The fact that it's a quest, not a journey. I like that. I think that's that's one of the reasons Tolkien's Lord of the Rings has had such a, an impact upon people's because it is a quest. There is a quest there with a with a, with no certainty as to what the end will be. And uh, and I think in a world which is so heavily machine oriented, um, I think that's a beautiful thing.
the human skill. And so to get back to you know the, the skill of being able to connect and have conversations over the screen, um, I, here's another thing we have in common. Um, we have uh, Seth Godin in common. That's I don't true. know. I, you have met him, perhaps. I haven't. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I have, I have been a part of the one of the courses that he ran. It was I described it as one of the three best things that have happened to me in my life. Um, Is that the Alt MBA. The, the Alt MBA. That was uh -huh. indeed the one. Um, I I I have to tell you a couple of stories here. Yeah, but, I uh, hear of, this. of the, of the yeah. three things, of the three things, I said the first one's always uh, has been um, me finding my wife. I think uh, it was again a quest. I wasn't quite sure what it was, uh -huh. uh, but we've been together now over twenty. We were talking about this last night. We went for a, it was a hot, muggy night here, so we went for a walk on the beach, um, and left the kids behind, which was fascinating. And they they lived <laughs> to tell them. Um, but we were talking. We've been together for twenty years, and she was probably the one of the best things that happened. The, the first best thing that happened in my life. The second one was um, Dr. Barbara Oakley's learning how to learn. It's a free course on Coursera, and I didn't pretty much know anything about what it was, but it I thought it sounded interesting, and so I dialed up, joined on Coursera the course, and I've done it multiple times. As in, it's a good reminder for for you about how to learn, and she talks about lots of these concepts. Um, it's supposedly one of the f most completed courses on Coursera ever. MOOCs have a huge dropout rate, and most people who join in complete that course. Oh. The story, though, is a fascinating one because I wrote to her, too, um, just like I wrote to you. Uh -huh. To thank her, for one, for putting it out. It was it was yes. a generous gesture. Oh, clearly, yes. And she told me about how she had to do it. And, you know, the whole thing was shot by her husband, Phil, in their basement in um, Michigan, I think is where they, they live. She's a professor over there. Um, and then she told me about a lot of other things. And then she also told me she was coming to Australia. Um, for a talk. So we planned to meet and then I invited her to come in and talk at, at my workplace uh, if she had the spare time and she did. And it was, it has still been rated within internal things as one of the finest talks they've ever heard. And I host a lot of these talks. Um, and it's been fascinating because again, like I said, that was the second finest one. And the third one was the Alt MBA. Four weeks of intense work. I was terrified of signing up to it. You know who is who am I um, to sign up to all of these wonderful smart folks from around the world, um, spending four weeks and talking about it, including the day until the day of the first call. This is completely online. Um, my cohort was all Eastern time based, unlike previous ones. I think where you had people from across the globe, so it didn't have the same struggle as previous um, cohorts. But I was still terrified. I went, I can't understand why I would want to do it. And the reason I signed up was, was another colleague of mine and I have been teasing each other about it. Um, he's another gentleman I'd love you to have a chat with. And he he said to me, he said, Neil, we've talked about this for three years now. We better do it. And I said, I'll do it if you do it. And he says, he sent me a, a note. He's saying, done. I had no choice. I had to sign up. And um, I told him that. I said, I'm still terrified. I'm not quite sure we should do it. But it showed me that you could actually build quite deep relationships with people around the world um, or even locally. Uh, a lot of us in in this part of the world caught up for a couple of drinks and, and we still are in touch. Uh, and we know about at least a little bit. And two, three years later now, it happened just before COVID stuck. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing. Uh, January of 2020 was when... I did my, was my uh, course. March is when COVID stuck. And guess what? I had never considered Zoom as a serious way of engaging and connecting. And just the fact that we did it was four weeks of intense practice meant that when COVID stuck and we all started working on Teams or Zoom and whatever else it was, I didn't find it a struggle at all. I knew how to have good relationships. I knew how to meet new people. And, um, you know, people complain about not, not having water cooler conversations. I went, it's a click away. Yeah. You know everybody. Oh, you yeah. know, there's an organizational chart. You can just have to click on the person and call them directly and you can have a video conversation. How good is that? I mean, technology was dragged into, um, oh, 
organizations were kicked into using technology that they would otherwise have taken what two decades or so and to me it was like a gold mine so let me ask you and you and I, you don't need to reference your company specifically but just in general what's the long term effect of this 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 now facility for conversation through zoom and skype and these kinds of programs what's the long term effect upon the way businesses function i'd be lying if i said i knew ed i have i have no idea okay. but i do see these small pockets of change that are happening in ways that are distinct so i'll take the kids as an example my kids i saw them struggle in the first couple of weeks like i thrived during covid because i could reach out and connect my children didn't or maybe my son did um which is a different story but my my daughter didn't and there was a, one of the one of the biggest things there was when you're in at a certain point in your life if you are the way you grow if, um, evolution and all of the other things is through human contact you learn you learn slowly but that becomes part of who you are i'm not saying that good experiences are bad ones i'm just saying that's how we learn and mm -hmm. when you're deprived of it for a sustained period of time you have to compensate somehow and different people cope differently um well said adults adults had exactly the same problem that was my observation at work there were a group of us that absolutely thrived in it we went this is awesome this is wonderful we can connect people and i created a bunch of uh, conversations i would say uh, which have been which even to date, I have people reaching out and asking why I don't do them anymore. Um, work has taken on a different dimension for me, so I've not hosted them as many. But I had 50 of these conversations that I set up. People telling their own stories. They're yeah. not public speakers. They're not leaders. They're people just coming in and telling us about, well, I built 3D printer. I built this thing using a 3D printer. Um, I had someone else, and I'm talking about some of the most memorable ones. One of the young grads who used to work for me uh, is a hacker. An insomniac, and uh, as a young as a young person, he went. I don't have a story to tell. I don't know what to talk about. And my question, quite simply, was, how did you turn into hacking as a profession? And so his talk was about hacking his way into a career. And he turned. I I, I like to think that he thinks this this has been the finest talk he did. But he told me that he said, um, I love the exercise. He fought me tooth and nail. He's going, why do I need to write this out? And he's a young, he's just a young guy who came out just out of uni. Um, so I was helping him put his thoughts together. And, and I work with all of these people who do these talks. But that was probably one of the fun uh, I've had the um, pleasure of hosting. Wow. You can still hear me, I hope. I, I hear you, yes. Okay, it, it yeah. dropped out here for a second. Um, and there was another set of conversation, and this one I think is the finest for me ever. So because I work with the telco, we've got lots of people who go out to field. And uh, I don't know about what that means to people around the world, but I find that a field technician or somebody who's working most of the time out in field have great stories because they're constantly, every day meeting people. Right. And I was I have always been fascinated with that part of of the company's business and I realized that um, I connected a few of the last years just before International Women's Day I didn't I hadn't thought about International Women's Day anyway but um, I reached out to some of them I did what you did right which is can you tell me a few people who you can who I should get to know and I was referred to these uh, one lady and then I went well there could there should be more and I found a few more and so four of them, I helped craft their stories, just 10 minutes. Um, they're out in field always writing, scribbling notes, sending me things, and I coordinated um, people from around the country. And funnily, until the day they actually did their talk, they had never met. Wow. And but, to me, that was that was the most fascinating. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I did a project uh, many years ago now for almost 15 years ago and i was i was hired to do a value write a value statement for a company at a team 
new CEO had come in. He had been there for four months and he had not made any declaration about his intentions for the company. The, the board had made its intentions to either grow the company to sell or grow the company to acquire other companies. You know, that was their goal, but he had not talked about anything. But what he was doing was he was going around and having conversations with people. This was an electrical utility. And so he would go, um, you know, at around 5, 5.30 in the morning out to the line operations uh, with the linemen who go up and work on the poles and work on the lines and the strings. Line. And he would go out there and he would take the breakfast. He'd show up in a t-shirt and jeans and they'd sit around and eat breakfast, talk about their families, their life, their, their, their sports teams, you know, and they didn't talk about work. And they got to know him as Paul. He was Paul. He got to know them by their first names. He got to know who their children and their spouses were. And um, and so when the time came for us to have, you know, to present this this um, value statement that the team had written, we, you know, they had made their decision, and we invited him to come in, and um, and we hid the votes for you know there are five different choices, and they picked one by a uh, by a pretty large margin, and he came in and he said, well, Paul, which one do you pick? And he picked the one that they picked. And the emotion that went through that room was uh, unlike anything I'd ever seen in a business context, because it was like, okay, we're going to be all right as a company. This guy, we can trust. We know this guy because he has been having one-to-one -one personal first name only conversations with us. And that that's the sort of thing that you and I are talking about. You know, I, um, you know, my guess is that, you know, we all have this, this experience of going into a, a, a place where there are a lot of people we don't know, and we're introduced to someone and they say, oh, well, do you know so-and-so? I said, yeah, I know so-and-so. And all of a sudden, we, we're now together. We're, yes. we're part of a, a, a group. A tribe. Yeah. A tribe. And, yeah. um, and, I, and I think the purpose of our conversation is really to communicate that to people. The, this is not just for us. This is for you. Indeed. And, and, you know, and you, you've already alluded to it, you know, but my purpose here is to meet people. I, you know, this is an experiment in, in networking. And I want to meet people not just to have a good conversation, one conversation. I want to meet people so that I can know them over a long period of time. And we can um, have conversations where we, I'm, I, I'm using this term intentionally, mutually mentoring one another um i i did a recently i did a an interview with a a young woman who's early mid-20s she's a, a a university student and we and this is what we were talking about you know typically my generation and her generation i would be viewed as a grandfather figure i'm an old man i'm a elder and so i am there to to bestow upon her my wisdom. Well, I may have some wisdom, but as I told her, says, I'm here to learn from you. You need to tell me what I need to know about Gen Z's, the Gen Z's. I don't know, you know, tell me. And so that was where our conversation was. And, and it's the same, it's same with, with you. I need to hear what you say, because that teaches me about what I need to understand about you and the world that you inhabit there in Australia. And I've never been to Australia. I'd like to go. Um, You're welcome. They all get there. Um, but it's speaking it, tour. Yeah. Well, um, if I come, I'm coming for at least a month because I, I want to drive across the continent. It'll take you more than a month, from what I've gathered from from my field tech folks, friends. <laughs> well, I thought I'd, I'd 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 hitch a ride on a truck, on a cattle truck. It, it drive all the way across the. <laughs> yeah. no, I got to go to Alice Springs, and I got to go. I got to go where uh, Man from Snowy River was uh, filmed. Well filmed. Yeah. One of my favorite movies, you know. And um, and I want to go to Perth, where they had the the America's Cup race back in the mid '80s, and I remember getting up in the middle of the night to watch the races, and it was just it's just awesome. <laughs> it's just awesome. So I, I have this um, very 
um, um, fantasy view of Australia being this really special place. And, I'm and sure we don't have know. enough snakes. And I'm we don't sure. have any snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any in the 15 years I've been here. Maybe one. Well, we'll we will we'd go out and find it. Hey, this this has been really great. I know we, there's more to talk about. We'll, we can talk about that next time. Um, because I'd like to do this again. Because I think this is the sort of thing that is an example to others about how how two people who have never physically been together. Can have a conversation where there's really a lot of um, real meat and real um, depth to the conversation. And um, thank you so, so if much. So people want to find you in some way. Uh, how do they find you if they somehow want to connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best. Um, okay. I'll share with you my LinkedIn details. I do think um, I, I've tried to have as low an online presence as I could. Uh, I found myself struggling with social media, and so I got rid of all of the um, social media things that I had. And so LinkedIn is probably the only one that I do scroll at this point in time. Okay. Um, not very good. But we'll, LinkedIn we'll, is it is. We'll put that in the show notes so everybody can, you know, send you a comment. And so... That'd be awesome. I'd for, love to meet more here. people too. And um, and I guess it's in the middle of the week there, so or it's in the week. So I guess Friday. you're up for the rest of the day. I am. <laughs> <laughs> and for a long, long time. I've got uh, it's, it's gonna be a long day. But Ed, thank you so much for having me on. Well it's as been usual, my honor always, to have you. And I uh, appreciate and, you very much. And thank you for your for your um your kind thoughts. And everyone, and thank, thank you for being here. Um please subscribe and hit the like button, but even more so leave us a comment because I think. You're, when you make a comment, you're entering into our conversation, and so it becomes our conversation. Our and I, and I, and many of the people that I am interviewing are people that I've met through their comments on various substacks and blogs. So that's the way that's just the way the world is now working. So be a commenter, don't be a troll, but be a commenter, and let's uh, celebrate the opportunity to have conversations all over the world um, as if we were sitting together in the same room. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.